8. All right, Judges chapter 8. Let's pray. Father God, again, we thank you for this time tonight. Thank you that we can come together. For those that are gathered here tonight, Lord, you have a word for all of us, and that may we receive that word. Open our ears and open our hearts to what you have for us tonight. Speak to us. Abide with us. Because we are here for you, Lord. We're here for you. And so may you be with us. And it's in your great name, Jesus, we pray. Everyone said, Amen. All right, Judges chapter 8. Look at verse 18. Then he said to Ziba, this is Gideon, then he said to Ziba and Zalmunna, where are the men whom you killed at Tabor? They answered, as you are, so were they. Every one of them resembled the son of a king. And he said, they were my brothers, the sons of my mother. As the Lord lives, if you had saved them alive, I would not kill you. Verse 29. So he said to Jether, his firstborn, rise and kill them. But the young man did not draw his sword, for he was afraid, because he was still a young man. Verse 21, Then Zeba and Zalmunna said, Rise yourself and fall upon us, for as the man is, so is his strength. And Gideon arose and killed Zeba and Zalmunna, and he took the crescent ornaments that were on the necks of their camels. Then the men of Israel said to Gideon, Rule over us, you and your son and your grandson also, for you have saved us from the hand of Midian. Verse 23, Gideon replied, Gideon said to them, I will not rule over you, and my son will not rule over you. The Lord will rule over you. The Lord will rule over you. Back in the mid to late 80s, there was a sitcom starring Scott Baio. You may remember Scott Baio. He was on the show Happy Days. Then they did a little spinoff with Scott Baio and it was Joni and Chachi, right? Chachi was Scott Baio's character in Happy Days. But in the mid-80s, Scott Baio came back. He started a new show called Charles in Charge. And I wish my brother Chuck was here. I'd totally give him a hard time for this. But Charles, played by Scott Baio, was a 19-year-old college student. And he was looking for work while going to school. And he happens to come across an opening, a position, for a family who is in need of a live-in caretaker, a live-in nanny, if you will. And in lieu of a salary or wages, Charles would receive free room and board. He would receive free room and board for his duties as a caretaker for those kids in that home. And so while the parents were away, were they at work or traveling, Charles would be in charge. He would be the one to have the authority in the home to lead the home. But the kids, as you can imagine, did not always agree with that. They didn't like this setup. They didn't really want this college guy, Charles, to have this role, especially over their own lives, especially in their own home. Charles was in charge, but these kids would not always recognize it or acknowledge that Charles was the one in charge. As the one who should rule over them or be lead over them and have that authority over their life. As the one who was to lead them. And what would be the result? of their lack of acknowledging Charles as the one in charge, there would be trouble. The kids in that family would find themselves in a bit of trouble. Each time they trusted in someone other than Charles, they would mess up. They would find themselves in a mess and would need his help to get out, to be rescued. And so tonight in our scriptures, Gideon's going to remind us of who's really in charge. Gideon's going to remind us of who really should be in charge over your life, over our lives. Who should rule or reign over your life? Who should lead you? And let me just say, it's not Charles. <laughs> it's not Charles. And let me also say, it shouldn't be you either. It needs to be the Lord. I'm talking about the Lord Jesus. I'm talking about God's Messiah. 
No person, no drug or addiction or idol, not even yourself should be in charge, should rule your life. Only the Lord. But why? Why only the Lord? Because salvation is found in no one else. There's no other name under heaven by which we can be saved. We may want to believe or think otherwise, but the truth is, is that it should only be the Lord. Because God has done something extraordinary for you, for us. He has done the impossible on our behalf, on your behalf, by rescuing us from the mess we have made because of our sin, our disobedience. He has saved us out of the hands of our enemies, something only God could do, and not man, not even yourself. So look again at verse 18 of Judges chapter 8. It says, Then he said to Ziba and Zalmunna, Where are the men whom you've killed at Tabor? They answered, As you are, so were they. Every one of them resembled the son of a king. And he said, They were my brothers, the sons of my mother. As the Lord lives, if you had saved them alive, I would not kill you. So he said to Jether, his firstborn, Rise and kill them. But the young man did not draw his sword, for he was afraid, because he was still a young man. Then Ziba and Zalmunna said, Rise yourself and fall upon us, for as the man is, so is his strength. And Gideon arose and killed Ziba and Zalmunna, and he took the crescent ornaments that were on the necks of their camels. After Gideon taught his lesson to the people of Sakoth and Penuel that we looked at last time, he was ready to finish off the Midianites by killing these two kings, Ziba and Zalmunna. And we find that with Gideon there were some personal reasons behind his hunt for these two guys. There were some personal reasons, and he was wanting to kill these kings of Midian because they killed his brothers. Brothers from another, brothers from the same mother, excuse me. Uh, they were his family. They were his brothers. So Gideon calls up his own son, Jether, and to slay these two men, which would be humiliating, humiliating for these two guys. This is going to be humiliating. Hum, I can't speak tonight. This is going to be humiliating for these kings to be slain by this young man. But Gideon's son, Jether, was too afraid. So Gideon rose up and did it himself at the request of these conquered men, these fallen kings. And Midian was finished. There was a victory. There was a great victory. The Midianites were finally and completely conquered. This oppressive and abusive force that lasted for seven years was finally overcome, finally destroyed. But how? How did that happen? Was it because of Gideon? Or was it because of the Lord? It was because of God. It was because of God. He did this amazing work. He did the impossible. He accomplished what was impossible for Israel to do themselves. Remember, it was 135,000 Midianites against, at most, 10,000 Israeli soldiers. And then eventually 300 soldiers. And it was a great victory. It was a glorious victory. And the Lord raised up this man, Gideon, to save the people of Israel from their enemy, from the hands of the Midianites. This oppressive and strangling force that lasted for seven years, that included these two kings, their princes, and an army of 135,000 men. And if you remember from back in the beginning of chapter 6, the Midianites, this oppressive force, an abusive force, was because of Israel's own sin. Midian was there because of Israel's sin, their idolatry, their disobedience. Chapter 6, verse 1 says this, The people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord gave them into the hand of Midian. And Midian overpowered Israel. The whole reason why Israel was in this position, oppressed by Midian, was because of their own sin against the Lord. It was their fault. That's the mess they created. That was their sin that put them in this position to begin with. And the only way out from it, the only way to escape it or be rescued uh, from it was not by man, but by God. It was the Lord who made victory possible. Israel could not conquer Midian on their own. They needed God. And so do we. So do we. 
Israel cannot achieve victory by their own hands or strength or wealth or affluence or title. They needed the Lord. He needed to make a way. God made it possible for these people to be rescued from the oppression, which was the result of their own sin. God made it possible. Flip over to Matthew chapter 19 real quick. To the right, just a little, a little ways. Matthew chapter 19. Look at verse 23. Matthew 19, verse 23, it says, And Jesus said to his disciples, Truly I say to you, only with difficulty will a rich person enter the kingdom of heaven. And verse 24, Again I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished, saying, Who then can be saved? But Jesus looked at them and said, with man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. With God, all things are possible. What is Jesus saying here? He's saying that it's impossible for man to save himself. It's impossible for us, for you and I, to save ourselves. It's easier for a camel to go through an eye of a needle than for us to save ourselves. That's how difficult it is. In other words, it's impossible. especially if you're a rich man. But Jesus tells us, but with God, with God, all things are possible. God can do the impossible, and we see that in our text here in Judges with the Lord raising up Gideon and an army of 300 men to save a nation, a people from, save a people from their enemy. And as we looked at when we studied that, it was impossible. It was terrible odds. There was no way, no way Israel was going to win. But not for God. Not for God. The Lord saved Israel from their enemy that came as a result of their own sin and disobedience. And praise the Lord, he has done the same for you too. Praise the Lord that he has done the same. God has done the impossible for you too. What is impossible for us? was made possible, possible by his son, Jesus Christ. Flip over to Matthew chapter 1 real quick. Just to the left a tiny bit. Matthew chapter 1. <clears throat> Look at verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way when his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph before they came together. She was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a, a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife. For that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he, shall, he will save his people from their sins. He will save his people from their sins. This is what's so wonderful about Christmas. Because this will transpire, transpire into what we will celebrate here soon. Easter. When Jesus would make his way to Calvary, he would die on that old rugged cross and pay the price for your sins. And then rising again that third day. God the Father raised up his own son, Jesus, to save or rescue you and I from the mistakes we have made, from the mess we are in because of our own sin, our own, sin, our own disobedience. Jesus came to save you from the consequence of your own actions. To save you from what was your own fault, your own sin. That includes me as well. The Father saved you and I by giving us his Son to make right what we did wrong. 
And we praise God for that. Where did that happen? That happened at the cross. God made possible what was impossible for us to do on our own. Save us from our enemy, sin and death. It was a great victory. It was a glorious conquest that was done for your sake. That was done on your behalf. And in nothing else and no one else can we find our salvation only in Jesus. And all we have to do is just look around. All we have to do is just look. Turn on the news. Read the headlines. Our nation is a mess. It is chaos out there. That's because of us. That's because of man. That's what we did. We did that. That's all because of our sin. And man alone will not, cannot fix it or save us from it. Trump will not save us. But God has. And God will save you. We need to look beyond man. We need to look up and see who is seated at the right hand of the Father. That is where your salvation is found. That is where your hope needs to be placed, not down here. Don't miss it. Don't miss it. Look at verse 22 back in Judges chapter 8. All the way back to the left a little bit. Verse 22, Judges chapter 8. Then the men of Israel said to Gideon, Rule over us, you and your son and your grandson also, for you have saved us from the hand of Midian. This verse here is the first mention of the people wanting a ruler or a king over them. And so this now starts that path that will lead us to David, that will eventually lead us to the king of kings, Jesus. But the men, the people of Israel, wanted a leader, a king to rule over them, someone to be in charge. Charles wasn't around back then, so they asked Gideon. And so they sought after this man because they believed he was the one who had conquered their enemy. They believed he was the one who saved them. And they missed it. They misunderstood who was truly responsible for this great victory, for their salvation. They were looking to this man and they were not looking to the Lord. And truly they wanted a man to lead them and not the Lord. Which brings up a great question. Who or what do you look to for salvation? Who do you look to? Where is your hope placed? Is it in dollar signs? Is it in an elected official or past president, a drug, a website, an app? Is it yourself? Is it yourself? The world for the past several years, likes to spread these false ideas that we need to place our hope in ourselves, trying to empower us, telling us that you have the power, you are strong enough, you will be victorious, you will conquer your enemies, you can do anything. But is that where where you have been focused? Is that where you have been focused? Is that where your victory, is that where your salvation is found? In you? Or is it the Lord Jesus? Is it the Son of God? Because that is where it should be. That is where it needs to be. You know, Easter is coming soon, but what does that mean to you? What does Easter mean to you? Is it just another holiday where we can hide and hunt for eggs, chocolate bunnies, baskets? Or is it where we look to and remember where our hope is found? Because Easter is where we find true salvation. Easter is where we find our victory. In an old rugged cross where Jesus died. In an empty tomb where Jesus laid for three days. And let me just say how appalling it is to me and how disrespectful it is to our Lord when churches out there Encourage people to come and attend their place of worship because they have an Easter bunny. That that is appalling. And they do Easter egg hunts. How appalling that is because here at church, people need to know where to find salvation. They need to know where they can find hope, real hope. They need to know where they can find Jesus. 
and not where they can be entertained or their kids can have a good time. And not where they can take pictures with a teenager dressed in a bunny costume. That's not church. It's not another place, another place where their families can do egg hunts or anything else that is empty and shallow, that is hopeless. That's not church. Easter is about how God went to battle for you and those you love to gain you victory over your enemies. To rescue us from this mess we have created as a result of our own sin. And to give you a future and a hope. And yet, some will think it's wise to compromise that message or block that message with worldly garbage. Listen, God has done something amazing and powerful, and you need to find it, and you need to see it. And you need to understand it. What God has done for you, or are you missing it? Are we missing it? Are you denying it? Many people tend to look the other way, look away from Calvary's hill where Jesus, our Savior, died. They refuse to believe what took place over 2,000 years ago and are still trusting in other things, looking to man, looking to themselves, looking away from the only place where true hope is found. Thinking hope and salvation is found somewhere else, in someone else, and eventually, sooner or later, later they're going to figure out the truth that there is salvation in no other name than Jesus Christ. And I pray it won't be too late when they figure this out. Salvation isn't found in me or in you or this world, but in the risen Savior, our Messiah. And he is who we need to be looking to, who we need to follow, and who we need to lead us. Gideon reminds us of this important truth. Look at verse 23. Gideon said to them, I will not rule over you, and my son will not rule over you. The Lord will rule over you. Gideon points these people, these guys, in the right direction. Away from himself. Away from his son and his own family. Away from themselves. Away from his son his family, and away from them. He points them away from man. He points them to the Lord. Because he knows who has truly saved their nation, their people. It was the Lord, and guess what? That's exactly where we need to look to. That's where our focus needs to be today. Gideon's words are not just true, not just, are just as true as they were as today as they were back then. The Lord is where we are to focus, and the Lord is where we are to keep our focus. Right on Jesus. Salvation is in no other. The Apostle Paul reminds us of this. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 1 through 2 says, If you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. He says, look up. Look to see Jesus. Seek him with all your heart and all your mind, for he is the only one who can save you. Flip over to Luke chapter 8, chapter eight to the right a little bit. Luke chapter 8. Look at verse 40. It says, Now when Jesus returned, the crowd welcomed him, for they were all waiting for him. And there came a man named Jairus, who was a ruler of the synagogue, and falling at Jesus' feet, he implored him to come to his house, for he had an only... He had an only daughter, about 12 years of age, and she was dying. As Jesus went, the people pressed around him, and there was a woman who had, had, who had a discharge of blood for 12 years. 
And though she had spent all her living on physicians, she could not be healed by anyone. She came up behind him and touched the fringe of his garment, and immediately her discharge of blood ceased. And Jesus said, Who is it that touched me? When all denied it, Peter said, Master, the crowd surrounded you and pressed in on you. But Jesus said, Someone touched me, for I perceive that power has gone out from me. And then the woman saw that she was not hidden. She came trembling and falling down before him, declared in the presence of all the people why she had touched him and how she had been immediately healed. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. So here we find two people in need of help. We find two people in need of help. Jairus' daughter was dying. And where does Jairus look to? To Jesus. He goes to Jesus. He comes seeking help from the only one who can save his daughter, Jesus. His hope was in Jesus, and the Lord will heal his daughter as you keep reading. But there's someone else who needed help too. A woman who has been bleeding for 12 years and she spent all of her money, all she had on physicians, on doctors, on treatments, looking to man for healing. But nothing, no relief and no help until she finally turns to the Lord and comes seeking after Jesus and pursuing him. Knowing and understanding that there was no other man, no other place to find hope for her. All the money in the world could not save her. But the Son of God could. Jesus could. Nothing else and no one else who could save her. Only Jesus. And he is the one who we are to look to. And he is the only one who should lead us. Because he's the only one who can save us. So the question then is, Will you let him? Will you let him? Will you allow Jesus to rule over you, to lead you to be in charge, to be in charge over your life? Will Jesus be your Lord? You see, there are many today, many out there today who are like these men here in Judges, who want all the benefits of God's awesome victory, but will not have Christ be their Lord and Savior. Is that you? They still want a man to be in control, to be in charge, to rule over their lives, including themselves, and not God. They want to remain in charge, live their own lives, be the captain of their own ship, the king of their castle. They want to remain in the driver's seat and still receive forgiveness for their sin and still receive everlasting life. But that's not how it works. That's not what God's word tells us. Flip over to Matthew chapter 7. Just to the left, just a little bit. Matthew chapter 7. Look at verse 21. Jesus says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. So who enters the kingdom of heaven? The Bible says the man or woman who does the will of God. God's will. Who enters the kingdom of heaven is the one who does God's will. Not their own, not someone else's, but God's will. And so what is God's will for you then? First and foremost, it's to acknowledge that we are sinners. We are sinners. We have messed up and we need help. We want help. We need a rescue from this mess we are in. From our sin. And we need to understand what the Father has done by sending us His Son, Jesus Christ, to save us from our sin. 
by dying on a cross, rising again, and then we need to surrender our lives to him. Having him take the wheel, having Jesus be in charge because of the amazing and awesome work he has done on our behalf. The amazing work he has done for you. Because only in Christ do we find salvation. Only in Jesus is there hope. No other name under heaven by which we can be saved but Jesus. Nowhere else. So let me ask you. I like asking questions. <laughs> but let me ask you, who's in charge? Who's in charge? Who rules over your life? Who has dominion over you? Gideon's account reminds us that it needs to be the Lord because of the amazing work God has done for you. The amazing battle that God has fought and has won for you. Over your enemies, he has fought and won the battle against our enemies, sin and death, a battle impossible for you and I to even take on. But not with God. Not with the Lord Jesus, who makes all things possible, even our salvation. The Lord is the only one who can save us. Christ fought for you and Christ won. It's an amazing victory. He is an amazing God who loves you. And he is the only one who needs to be in charge. Not Charles. Not Chuck. Not you. Not me. Just Jesus. Just Jesus. Right? So the question we have to ask, though, is he? Is Jesus in charge? Is Jesus your Lord and Savior? If yes, then praise God. Amen. Hallelujah. And let him lead you. Let him be in charge. And may you abide with him. But if not, if Jesus is not yet your Lord and Savior, why not? Why not? Who's in charge of your life then? Who rules over your life? God's word has shown us that there is hope in no other, only Jesus. He is the one to save. Not you. Not man. Not money. Just Jesus. Only Jesus. So don't miss it. I pray we don't miss it. Don't deny it. Don't turn away from the truth. Understand and receive what God has done for you. And let him lead you. Let the Lord be in charge. Amen? Amen. All right, let's pray. Father God, we just thank you again for this time tonight. Thank you so much for your word. Thank you for reminding us that you need to be in control. You need to be, need to be in charge. And Lord, that when we take things in our own hands, things fall apart. Things become a mess. But you need to be in charge. You need to rule over us because you've done such an amazing, impossible work that we could never accomplish. You saved us. So in you, Jesus, there is hope. In you, Jesus, there is salvation. No other name, no other place, no other thing. Just you, Jesus. So let our hearts and our eyes and our lives be focused and fixed on you. Help us to look up. Look towards you. No other name can we be saved. No other name but yours, Jesus. May you be in charge, and may you help us to get out of the way, to hand over the keys and let you drive. And we love you. We thank you for all you've done. And it's in your great name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Thank <laughs> you.